Well, thank you so much for joining us. We're here together in the chapel of Gateway Seminary on our Ontario campus. And we've come together as friends and as colleagues to discuss the doctrine of Christ, who Christ is and what he's done. And to introduce our speakers today, we have immediately to my right, Dr. John Schaus, who is our senior professor of Christian theology, and Dr. Chris Chun, who is our professor of Christian history. And I'm Dr. David Rathel, associate professor of Christian theology here at Gateway. And I'm so happy that you all have joined us today so that we can have a fun conversation. Our goal is to introduce to you the kind of topics we discuss in a seminary class, to give you a taste of the Gateway experience, to see what you could look forward to as a student here at our seminary. And just to open up, to introduce how academic work operates at our school, I want to begin by asking this question. Every single one of us will recognize that the doctrine of Christ is important. Who we say Jesus is and what we say Jesus did does matter. But some people, as they consider seminary, might have a concern that we could be too ivory tower-ish, that this could be too academic and not connected to personal sanctification, not connected to practical church ministries. So from the outset, we want to address what kind of topics do we address in a Christology class? And how do we connect those topics to Christian growth and Christian ministry? Well, David, I think Chris and I have been looking forward to this for a long time, being with you and uh, being able to round table together on this. You've asked a couple of questions. First of all, is, is theology getting in the way? Is it an academic uh, uh, hindrance? And uh, perceptions are sometimes reality, but theology isn't optional. It's right at the heart of everything the church does. It's from the church. It's for the church. It's direction, it's guidance, it's prayer, it's praise in our worship, in our evangelism, in our missions, in our discipleship. We are we're engaged in theological acts. Uh, sometimes we do it poorly, and early in my career there was a, an article I read on the Babylonian captivity of theology by the university. And indeed, sometimes theologians and people that are involved in school can uh, confuse their audience, and we can write for one another or write for the world, and but properly conceive theology is from the church and for the church and necessary. And you ask what we do in a Christology class, perhaps the most important question in the world, our eternal destinies. Both Jesus and the scriptures that tell us about him say is, what do you make of this man Jesus? And so we uh, consider how best to answer that. We consider his person, his work, who he is, what he did, his person, his natures. Uh, I personally find it helpful to uh, look at Christ typologically through biblical patterns and images. Uh, one of the most popular is the way he fulfills and completes offices of prophet, priest, and king. Um, I like to speak of the Christological plot of exaltation humiliation, exaltation, and through these, these categories and lenses, uh, we can come to know and praise Christ better. I think that's extremely well said, brother. I think that's right. And, and the great theologians that we all appreciate, so many of them operated in ecclesial context. That means they operated in the church, and they were doing their theological work in the church for the church. And in, in modern era, there can be that unhelpful divide sometimes between university and a local church body. But that's not always been our tradition. That's not what we always have done as theologians. And it's excellent to go back to the tradition and recover the thought of great thinkers who are operating for the local church body, writing profound works to benefit their congregations and the broader church at whole. That raises another question for Dr. Chun. Um, we inherit a significant tradition when we do our thinking about Christ. There are some great names in the Christological conversation. John of Damascus, Maximus the Confessor, Cyril of Alexandria. And so as Protestants, and we are in a Protestant evangelical context, how should we approach the tradition of the church? Um, we're committed to a principle of sola scriptura. That means the Bible is our source of authority. But how do we think as people committed to the Bible about the voices who have come before us, who've done work before our, our time, and how we should we, if we should, incorporate them into our work today? 
Yes, the big question for us, especially in the church history, in the, uh, as councils get together and sort out our understanding of triune God, this notion of how can we affirm one God in three persons? And I'd like to start up with the famous statement from Council of Chalcedon. It's the Creed of Chalcedon in 451. It goes like this. Just listen to this marvelous word. Uh, we also teach apprehend this one and only Son, Jesus Christ, only begotten into nature. And we do this without transfusing the two nature, without transmuting from one another, and without dividing them into two separate categories, without contrasting them according to the areas or function. The distinctness of each nature is not nullified by the union. Instead, the property of each nature is are conserved and both natures concur in one person and in one essence. They are not to be divided and cut into two persons, but are together in one and only begotten logos of God. The Lord Jesus Christ does have prophet of the old testify. Thus the Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us the symbol of the Father has handed down to us. It is just remarkable, isn't it? This the growing out of this controversy in the fourth century, often bitter at times, I believe under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you have now the historical orthodox position of the church, one that we affirm, one that we love, starting point of all our theology and discussion of Trinity and Christology down to our present day. This great creed that I just read often sounds twisted in our modern year, far wordier than it needs to be. But if you understand the historical background, if you look at each of the behind of these words, you can see how carefully they have crafted this document, these wordings. Because each of these behind these phrases, they are counter offenses we now know as a heretical position in the life of the church. So in the Chalcedon, you see various refuted heresies. Ebion, Ebionite, for example, deny the deity of Christ. Docetid, deny the humanity of Christ. Gnostic, deny the humanity of Christ. Apollarian, deny the uh, human, because in place of human spirit, they believe that there was a logos. Arius, deny the de deity. Uh, Eutychus, deny the distinction in nature. And historians just deny the union in nature. So, in effect, uh, Chalcedon set boundary as we were. No Christological speculation should not venture. And yet, creed, creed, these creed never claimed to be exhaustive portrait of Christ. But what it did was it provided the model in which both humanity and deity could be united in one person. This is not to say that Chalcedon is final, but neither is dispensable. Nothing less in our description of Christ can be permitted. Yet something may be more within our reach. This is why we still do our task of doing theology. Now, as for the uh, Reformation model, sola scriptura, reformers uh, did not say solo scriptura, they say sola scriptura, what they meant by that is that there is no authority above the scripture, not just Bible only. So um, not the Pope, not the council, but, the, but there would no, not, no other tradition should be above and more authoritative than scripture. And if you read the Bible the, and read the creeds and what God has revealed, about himself in the Bible, when these councils are get together and working out these the theology and doctrine, that is what they're exactly they're trying to do. They're working hard to put in precise language what they believe the Bible taught. So uh, as a result, Christians all over the world today have affirmed the view of Christ that, uh, and affirmed the Trinity that's uh, hammered out in the council because it is true to the scripture. 
the councils, therefore, are not substitutes for the Bible. It's a helpful guide in reading the Bible. So what should we do about these early Christian writers and the tradition? I would say absolutely yes. <laughs> we should read these early traditions. Not sola scriptura, but sola scriptura. No tradition will be above the scripture. That's extremely well said and very helpful. I, I um, often present it to my students as, you know, we believe in the communion of the saints. We are in fellowship with one another. But that communion is not just with those who are living right now. Amen. We're in communion with all of the other Christians who've come before us. And you're so helpfully telling us that through these writings, we can have communion with these great thinkers who lived in previous generations. We can gain from their insights as we try to interpret the Bible well today. Amen. That's very helpful. I, I uh, want to commend our church historian for giving a paying of praise uh, to the tradition that was so beautifully articulated and said. Uh, evangelicals sometimes get a little bit skitsy about uh, uh, scripture and tradition. That's a Catholic position, we think, because tradition, they say, uh, speaks on the same level, the same spirit that informed the scripture and forms the tradition. And so we, we shy away from scripture and, scripture and tradition. And in part for good reason, but perhaps uh, we've overlearned that lesson as evangelicals. There is no reading scripture without presuppositions. And although scripture is the norming norm, we come to it from places. And there is a, what we call a hermeneutical circle. There's a pushback from scripture and our presuppositions can change and we can grow and, and uh, be directed. But we always come from a place and our presuppositions, tradition in this case, are, are lenses or spectacles, which sometimes obscure, sometimes mislead, but also help us see, and we can't see without them. So the, uh, although scripture is the norming norm, it is scripture above all, it is scripture uniquely. We must read scripture with uh, the conversation of the church, the presupposition of the church, the voice of the church, our, our reason and our experience. So it is tradition and scripture, even though scripture is the only norming norm. That's absolutely right. And this is a longstanding, if you'll permit me to say, tradition in the church, to read the Bible in this way. The earliest Christians spoke about the regula fide, the rule of faith. Right, amen. And so as far back right. as Tertullian, uh, et cetera, they were talking about we read the Bible through a certain lens. This is how we're defining orthodoxy as we wrestle with the reading of the Bible, and we want to read the Bible in this way. This is a regular ruling way that we read the Bible well. This stuff. Yeah, so, so um, that helps us now as we think through, okay, we have the Bible, we have the tradition. We want to talk now, how do we preach about Christ well? We have these great resources that God and His grace has given to us. But I will say, when we first turn to the pages of the New Testament, preaching about Christ can seem to be rather difficult because you have certain texts that talk about, well, Jesus did not have knowledge about the future. He did not know the hour of his return, for example. Other texts where he seems to have extensive knowledge. You have texts where he's doing miracles and he's feeding th thousands of people and walking on water, and then other texts where he is uh, weak and tired and weary. And, and just how would the Bible and how would the tradition help us to think through preaching Christ well? How can we be faithful with such complex texts and are there any rhetorical errors to avoid? Anything that we should be aware of? Well, um, I've been a member of a church where Dr. Schaus has been a pastor for many, many years. And I, was, I sat under his preaching for uh, many years. And he would preach Christ from the pulpit year after year faithfully. So I'd like to ask this question and delegate this question to you, Dr. Schaus. Well, both of you have... Uh focused on the starting point, it is to preach Christ. Christ. Christ is the hot, white, burning center. It is him we love and by whom we are loved and what we preach, but uh, David's pushing that. Who is the Christ we preach and uh, what errors can we get into? I've already said I'm, I'm helped by typology, by biblical shape. I would say preach, we speak about preaching the whole counsel of God. 
and preach uh, the whole Bible. I, I think we get into problems when we preach Christ partially. And so there are people that try to make sense out of these what I call paradoxes. Uh, and well, let's talk about his human nature. Let's talk about his divine, this, this, par this part or this part. And um, somebody has defined a paradox as where two seemingly contradictory truths are both true. And I think my first counsel is preach the whole counsel, not only the gospel of Christ, fully God and fully human. You can't out-preach either one. I think we get in problems when we try and synchronize them or preach them partially or divide them. So I guess on a simple level, uh, that would be my first counsel to embrace the paradox and preach robustly and totally. I think that is absolutely right. Would you say that sometimes context determines what you might want to emphasize? So for example, when I served as a pastor, um, there were times that there was genuine suffering in our congregation. Um, and on those moments, I found myself drawn to the text in the gospels that did emphasize Jesus's humanity. Uh, Jesus experienced all that it means to be a human person. He knows what it means to be weary. He knows what it means to have friends betray him. He knows what it means to go through the toils of just everyday life. There were other times when I really wanted to magnify Christ as the unique divine one and his authority and his glory and splendor. Would you advise pastors to kind of read the context of the conversation and, and be aware in terms of your rhetoric? That is a great point. I had one... Uh wise pastor say, now this is dangerous to say, but he said, uh, really, any given sermon might be heretical in the sense that a heresy is often one pole of a tr theological truth without it being balanced by the other pole. And recognizing that, you can't preach everything all the time, and so we have to have some confidence in over the course of our preaching to get the balance, and sometimes we're going to emphasize one pole of a dialectical truth, which is exactly what you said. Now, it's important to get to the other pole, but we may not get to it totally in every particular sermon. That's really well said. That's very helpful pastoral counsel there. Now, we, we try our best to serve our students well at our, at our seminary by continuing to develop as thinkers, as researchers. And so just personally, what books have you all found? that are helpful in terms of Christological conversations uh, from the field of church history, from the field of systematic theology. Uh, what re recommendations would you have for our viewers today? Now, I'd like to recommend four books, if that's okay. <laughs> um, the first one is Athanasius on the Incarnation <laughs> of the Word of God. Second, Gregory, Gregory of Nazianzus on anti letters. And third, uh, San Anselm's Cordell Homo, and the fourth is St. Patrick's Breastplate. Um, first, the uh, Athanasius on the Incarnation of the World, certainly one of the great books in which history of the church and great book on this topic. Uh, it's very inspiring even to read it helpful today. Uh, after Mass of Nicaea, Athanasius became Athanasius Contra Mundum. Uh, Athanasius against the world. I mean, whole world. So after a Nicaea compromise was suggested, that church settled for a word, homoousias, which means similar substance, as opposed to homoousias, which means same substance. Athanasius thought that homoousia was better because, um, because it was, homoousia was too slippery, okay? But some believe that homoi usias were fairly orthodox. So now you have a whole world waging in this debate. Um, so um, you could see some some say that you know um, it's not fair to say it's not fair to say that I, Athanasius say it's not fair to say that Christ will be equal to the Father, and Athanasius argue and contend that the Church would not abandon the concept of homo usias. One skeptical uh, a cynic uh, scholar uh, made a lot of fun of this because, after all, his only difference is, is in the diphthong, right? Uh, 
<laughs> so he, he says, he's, the scholar says, just imagine the whole world torn apart because of a diphthong. <laughs> um, that was very stupid for him. <laughs> On the contrary, B.B. Warfield put it this way. The whole doctrine of Trinity and the unity and deity of Christ reside in that Yoda. One letter can be extremely important because one letter say, Jesus is fully God. Without it, you have Jesus is something like God. Second book that I like to recommend is Gregory of Nazianzus, an uh, anti uh, apollinarian letter, uh, he, of which he wrote this uh, That which he has assumed, he has not healed, but which he has united is God is also saved. That sentence insists on the humanity of Christ. That's the basis for guaranteeing our salvation. So it's very interesting to see him phrase this and frame this in the context of soteriology. Athanasius said, if Christ is not God, we are not saved. It's, it's, that's the important point of this book, an incarnation of the divine word. If Christ is not God, if we are not saved because it takes God to save us. So doctrine of deity of Christ is tied to soteriology. Gregory would agree with that, but he, he frames it, if Christ is not man, we are not saved. So church began to move in a direction, the understanding of the full deity of Christ and the full humanity of Christ as a necessity for salvation. So these two ideas were fine joined together in the classic expression in the Middle Ages in the writings of St. Anselm, Cudeo Homo, which is my third book of recommendation. The question is, why God-man? Cudeo Homo is a classical attempt to express understanding why God became a man, which is a necessity for salvation. The older view of the understanding of atonement is a ransom to the devil view. As far as atonement is concerned, the ransom is paid to the devil, and that was why Christ was sacrificed on the cross. The devil would try to pull them away from God, and Christ has purchased okay, from the devil. And some church father, patristics, held this view in a rather crude way. But in Ansem, Curdel Homo, Ansem argues that the sin is affront to God's honor, and justice demands recompense by the perpetrator. So mankind must pay for the sins of disobedience, yet we're incapable of rendering satisfaction to God. So what's the solution? God-man, whose divine forgiveness is grounded in his perfect character. According to Anselm, God-man, Christ, divine and human, who's a man identified with sinner, taking on the sin and guilt in his person to die on the cross, to take the their place on the Christ, a substitute, who as God could now endure God's wrath. The last book that I'd like to recommend is St. Patrick's Breastplate. Mm. Uh, yes, that Patrick, the St. Patrick's Day Patrick, mm -hmm. that Patrick. Uh, uh, we, I don't have time to get into all the uh, ministry and life, but we do have his testimony, autobiography, uh, which is lovely work called St. Patrick's Breastplate. Uh, pa Patrick said that his, God is his breastplate. It's a protection against uh, uh, other Celtic gods, protection that put up himself. Uh, Patrick's faith is his breastplate, protect himself from all the goddesses of Ireland by calling and invoking the strong name of the Trinity. There's a very familiar pr phrase in Patrick's breastplate. It goes like this. Christ be with me, Christ before me, 
Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me. It's a very famous prayer from St. Patrick. And I would recommend that for your devotional reading, perhaps for your church members, uh, maybe on a St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> well, my beloved colleague, Chris Chun, has uh, just shown us the importance of the tradition and the church, the discipline of church history is uh, well represented here. On uh, contemporary level and introductory level, I think I'd suggest uh, Bernard Ram's Evangelical Christology, uh, Russell Aldwinkle's More Than Man, and a kind of level up in uh, uh, complexity, Millard Erickson, The Word Made Flesh. Uh, then it's very uh, uh, biblical scholar N.T. Wright's uh, book on Jesus and the Victory of God, which I read in four or 500 pages, and the resurrection wasn't in a book by that title. That's because he was going to write another 500-page book on the uh, resurrection. Both very interesting books, Richard Bauckham's uh, book. Uh, my favorite book right now, kind of a middle to advanced level, is uh, Steve Wellham's uh, God the Son Incarnate. Excellent book on Christology. And uh, then a book I disagree with the last third, but one of the most interesting books I have ever read, Tom Torrance on the back page says it's the most moving book he has ever read. It's on the death of Christ, Alan Lewis's um, Between Cross and Resurrection, A Theology of Holy Saturday. So those are some of my favorites, and I would recommend them. That's great to know. The uh, disadvantage of going last is some of the good books are already mentioned. So uh, my colleague, Dr. Chun, has already mentioned Athanasius is on the incarnation. That was certainly number one on my list as well. So the chun Rachel mind meld continues here. But uh, I will just say briefly about that work that I assign that in theology too, in its entirety, on the incarnation. And I assigned it with some trepidation because I wondered, because of its length and sometimes because of its depth, how the students would respond. And they loved it. Mm -hmm. They loved it because of its richness, because of its devotional value. It is truly a beautiful work. And so on the Incarnation by Athanasius, my number two choice would be Cyril of Alexandria on the unity of the person of Christ. I think that's very helpful. Cyril was writing against the Nestorian heresy, which as Dr. Chun said, is an attempt to divide the person of Christ in an unhelpful way. And Cyril provided us so many conceptual categories to think well of the united person. And then my number three choice is going to be a book I just finished. It's in a new series called Transpositions in Theology, uh, led, I believe, by Rowan Williams. It's called Eke Homo. Now, you have to be careful if you go to Amazon. If you type that in, the first thing that's going to pop up is Nietzsche. You don't want the Nietzsche book for your Christology, okay? Look further on the Amazon search list and find it. And uh, I believe the author's name is Riches. He has done a magnificent job just pulling together Bible and tradition. One that's also worth mentioning, just honorable mention, is Thomas Wenandi's book, Does God Suffer? Which gives us rich reflections on what happens in the crucifixion. We want to maintain that God does not suffer. He is impassable. But we also want to maintain that something genuinely happens on the cross. And Thomas's book reflects helpfully on this seeming paradox uh, and just gives us categories of thought. And so those are books that I would recommend. Now, as we sit in the Gateway Chapel, we're all very blessed to be here because Gateway is truly, if you look at the demographic data, one of the most diverse seminaries in North America and probably the world. And I don't say that with any exaggeration. Part of this arises from the fact of our geographic location. We are in Southern California and the West, broadly speaking. And so we have students who are coming out of South Korea, who are coming out of various parts of Asia. We have students who are coming out of Central and South America and Mexico. We have African-American students. And so when we teach, we are teaching this broad range of students who are going to minister all around the world in various contexts. And so we attract a diverse range of students. We send our students out to diverse places. We are the Biblical Missional Global Seminary. That's our tagline. And so we have our eyes set on the world, sending people out. And so we want to have a conversation about Christology, but a conversation that looks its eyes far afield. 
And so are there any resources or helpful guidelines, books, that you could recommend to help us think about Christology or conversations about Christology that are happening beyond just kind of a uh, typical um, context that seminaries operate in? You know, wh what's happening on the global stage? Mm -hmm. Dr. Reito, I agree with you. Our seminary is known for being a global seminary, probably uh, the one of the most uh, multi-ethnic uh, seminary uh, in the world. Um, I don't mean to offend anyone when I, when I say this, but um, in spite of all that, I've always been a little uncomfortable with the adjective in front of theology. Uh, you have labels like African Christology, Latin America's Christology, Asian Christology, Western theology, I mean, this goes on and on, right? This is because I believe the truth is truth, no matter uh, where it is from, no matter who said it, truth is truth. Now, that being said, uh, if you are a person that only grew up and lived in a Western world, that person would have difficulty in understanding the richness of biblical imagery and concept found in the scripture. We all have, each culture have their own blind spots. I mean, how many of us have grown up in the Western world um, actually own a sheep or goat, right? Uh, when was the last time you slaughtered a live animal with the knife? Uh, if you did, the animal rights activists will take you to task if you were to do anything like that in your backyard. Uh, so most of us living in the West cannot fully appreciate the scriptural concept when described Jesus as the lamb that was slain. It's conceptual for many of us. By that conceptual, I have, con I have conceptual understanding of how difficult military boot camp might be, getting up early in the morning, running like there's no tomorrow. I have a conceptual understanding, but it's very different understanding than actually somebody who went through the military training, military boot camp. It's the experiential knowledge that we lack. It's concepts only. But when you read the both Old and the New Testament, they're filled with imagery of sacrificial system, which most Westerners only understand in concepts, not experience. However, both biblical writers and the original audience of the scripture had experiential knowledge in those sacrificial system. So they often, writers of the scripture presupposes that. You see, Old Testament priests were more like a butcher than a pastor today. Uh, we in the West don't think like that. Okay. This is why, for example, many Western, Western theologians should pay careful attention to what African theologian has to say about the doctrine of the atonement, which is part of Christology. Our African brothers and sisters and their theological reflection on the doctrine of the work of Christ will help us to bring the richness to the Western mind in our understanding of the atonement. Now, just, just, just one example. There are many examples like that. But when a non-Westerner or Western theologian begins to talk about these sorts of things, I think it's wise for people who are brought up in the West, receive their theological training in the West, pay special careful attention to what they have to say and uh, the uh, knowledge that they bring in interpreting the scripture. Chris has hit it out of the ballpark, and I think the critical word is, is richness. I'm struck by the fact that Christianity has successfully been spoken into every culture it meets. Now, it's critical of cultures, and critical is a negative. It simply means it asks questions of the culture. And there are some things 
culturally which are harmful or impediments to the gospel, and there are some things into which the gospel can and does speak. I'm, I'm uh, moved when I compare uh, Christianity's intrinsic multiculturalism to Islam, which is monocultural. We have one culture that is pervasive, and we try to make that universal. Uh, and so I personally have been so uh, deeply helped by my ability to uh, minister and worship in African-American contexts, and now more recently uh, uh, teaching in Africa, and the combination, the, the counterintuitive combination of, of suffering and joy, of exuberance and dance, of kinesthetic worship, uh, uh, is, is deeply enriching. I do share my colleagues' uh, caution about uh, uh, exaggerating cultural importance, and so it can become to be a little bit fancy or procrustean bed in which we try, we try and uh, conform the contagious, eruptious gospel of Christ into pre-existing forms and, and hence distort it. And I do think the, uh, the greatest theological dangers of my lifetime and, this, and the century before has been the inappropriate starting point of experience for theology. Not the appropriate. Experience is very important to theology. But often it is inappropriately uh, and naively used. And that has been in the history of theology a very dangerous and counterproductive move. I think that's absolutely right. Both of you have spoken so well on this issue. You can tell from what we're saying, we're all deeply committed to the Bible and to that universal truth claim and claims that are made in the Bible. We're deeply committed to the tradition and operating in the grain of the tradition. Mm. Uh, we're also committed, though, to notice, as Philip Jenkins and others have rightly said, that the focus of Christianity moving into the 21st century is the global South and other places. It's not necessarily the West. And so we're a seminary that's orthodox, that's committed to the Bible, that's committed to faithfulness, but it's committed to participating in the conversations that are happening around the world and learning from our brothers and sisters in these various cultural contexts. And that is uh, that is the essence, I think, of Gateway in many ways. Now, you raised an interesting point, Dr. Schaus, when you talked about trajectories in modern theology that are happening. And as we begin to slowly wind down, I wanted to raise that issue. What are some pressing issues questions, concerns that are happening right now in late 20th and early 21st century theology, uh, topics that people should be aware of as they consider uh, theological education and discussions in theology. Well, there are so many, and uh, most of them have antecedents in the history of the church that we learn from. One important one is uh, over, over 100 years old, the, the, the division between uh, really, for most of the history of the church, very quickly, the Jesus Christ, that confession, Jesus is the Christ, became almost a proper name, and in the 19th century, became divided. Uh, there's Jesus, the Jesus of history and rationality, and the Christ of faith, and there was this division between what was supposedly argued as the religion of Jesus and the awful religion about Jesus, and we're still... Uh, living with that chasm. We can talk about that. There, there are so many, but let me just focus on uh, the atonement is a very, very uh, uh, critical topic right now and very alive, and we can certainly talk about that. I, I'd like to uh, focus on what I think is the burning issue, and that is pluralism and whether or not Jesus Christ is a savior, one of many locuses of God's redeeming activity or or the Savior, at the heart of the Christian gospel, there has always been a scandal of the particularity of Christ. It is uh, Christ promises to unite the world and save the world, but he also divides the world. And uh, so I'm uh, very interested and think a burning topic is uh, pluralism in, in Christology. I, I agree with you. That is certainly an important topic. I, I also want to add, I think doctrine of God is a big topic of consideration these days. And we've had uh, the fortunate opportunity to have Dr. Kevin Van Hooser be here with us this week on our campus for our PhD seminars. Now, due to COVID, he's been able to uh, lecture via Zoom. He could not come in person. But Van Hooser is rightfully pointing out 
the topics in theology concerning divine impassibility. And again, that means that God cannot suffer. And, and uh, there are trajectories in modern theology that would go in a different direction from that classical claim. And so I think those are important topics that do have bearing on Christology. And so uh, those are issues of which you could be aware. As we begin to wrap up, um, we want to close with a gospel note. And we want to close by asking, what relationship does Christ's person have with his work? We're confessing a person, and we're confessing a person who did something. So his work is just as important as who he is. And so how might the doctrine of Christ, who we say he is, relate to his atoning work? What does that have to do in terms of salvation? What significance does Christ's unique identity as the God-man have for his cross work? And we can close with this gospel key here. Well, David, I think your answer is already resonant in the question itself. Christ does what he does because he is who he is. He is who he is because he does what he does. The, uh, the question is, is almost falsely taken. There, there can't be a dichotomy. Melanchthon, and it's sometimes attributed to others, uh, uh, is famous for saying that we know Christ from his benefits, but we only have benefits from Christ because he is the God-man. He is the one who has eternally come to show us how to live, but also to make that living possible by saving us and giving us a whole new starting point. Um, I, I really don't know where to go with the question other than he does what he does because he is what he is. He is what he is because he does what he does. Person and work not only belong together, sometimes in contemporary theology there's this unholy division again, this kind of Nestorian division between, well, let's just talk about a functional Christology. and Let's not push questions beyond that, but you, you can't talk about the function of Christ. He can only do what he does because he is in his person the person that he is. So we have to, the, the two belong together, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, I just re reiterate um, the point that Athanasius, as well as, as, well as Gregory uh, and Adianzas mentioned, that it really takes, Christ needs to be God because it really takes God to save us. Amen. And Christ really needs to be a human, fully human, because it takes God to be human to save us. Amen. That's, right. That's a great note to end on. You're right. I front-loaded that question, <laughs> and uh, you helped us put the cap on it by referencing the Cappadocians there. As we close out, we want to again say thank you for joining us, and we hope you found this conversation in some ways profitable. Every single one of us on this platform has served in local church ministries, and we obviously try to serve as best we can in the academy, and so we are I would think it's safe to say we are more than happy to have a conversation with you. If you have questions about seminary, questions about Gateway, questions about us as professors, our contact details are on the website, and feel free to, to make contact with us. We'll be happy to help as we can. God blessings to you as you pursue your ministry and your journey with Christ.